Well, I'm Ron, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is January 19th of 2020. And uh, man, there's a lot of people here tonight. Uh, yeah, January 19th, 2020. I walked into Provo number one that night for the first night, first AA meeting. Didn't know what I was in store for, hoping to gain a little bit of hope and find a way out of a problem I was in, you know. I had my my wife in tow. She agreed to go and check this deal out with me. And, you know, I liked what I heard there that night. I got a little bit of hope and a little bit of thinking there was a chance for me for the first time in a long time. Um, you know, Jay Bones, he's in the crowd here tonight, and he gave me a 24-hour chip that night, and that was special, but... What was more special was the hug he gave me. Like, this dude's passionate. Like, I was wondering if I had been violated while it was going on, you know. I don't come from a lot of huggers, and so here I am with this guy passionately hugging me. We get through the meeting, and then there's these other really rough-looking characters that, like, start hugging me some more. Like, the best way to describe it, and this has never happened to me, but I felt like I was being mauled and like raped by Rottweilers, you know. Um, yeah, so, well, thank you, Kevin and Spencer, for the reading and the introduction. Those of you that know me know they're real special guys to me, you know. I got some real good friends in these rooms like I've never had before. And, uh, I mean, in a addition to being good friends, like, you know, heck, my, my daughter's at Spencer's house tonight. We're rode over here with them. Like, our families are just close, and it's a cool deal, you know. If you do this thing, there's a lot of benefits that come with it. Uh, I guess I'm not completely surprised that I'm up here tonight. Spencer did mention to me, oh, a couple weeks ago, a month ago, he says, Ron, you work a fair to moderate program. <laughs> there's a chance you will be asked to speak given we've kind of been through everybody, you know? But those of you that know him, we love him for how just blunt and direct he is. Uh, God, he says some messed up stuff. Jackie and the kids were out of town a few weeks ago and we're talking on the phone. We still talk every night for the most part. And he ends with, hey, I'm just down the road from you. You know, if you decide you might want to hang yourself, feel free to swing by. <laughs> And, like, that's some messed up shit, but, like, I laugh at that today, and I need to hear it, because it gets me to where I can look at what's going in my life and what's happened, and I can see some humor in it, you know, not take myself so serious. Um, I'm feeling a lot of emotions tonight, like, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with the gratitude, you know. Um, I love this Alano Club and what it does, like, I come to a few meetings throughout the week here and you know more times than not I hit these speaker meetings and it's just a cool thing that I'm able to come and hear somebody's experience and relate to it and hopefully leave with like a little bit of direction going forward you know something to think about to work on and uh, it's just truly a blessing in my life like I'm nervous as hell like and I'm sure you can hear it in my voice but God, I think I've said you know like 25 times. Now, along those lines, Brant calls me what not Ron, you know? <laughs> and that's because in some rooms, when I'm nervous, they've heard me say what not like a kajillion times. Everything's followed up with I'm doing this and what not, and I did that and what not, you know what I mean and what not. So he calls me what not Ron. <laughs> and I don't know what to think about that. It's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing. I know other guys with worse nicknames, right? <laughs> but. You know, forgive me, if I get nervous up here tonight, like I'm South Utah County, I lived in Texas for a lot of years, like you're going to hear a whole nother backwoodsy language that you might not get, you know, but hopefully you get the drinking part. Um, I want to introduce my wife, Jackie, and, you know, my boys, I got my boys Cash and Adam here, his girlfriend, Kinley. Uh, we got a daughter that's 12 that I mentioned at home with Spencer's kids tonight, but... I just love my family and love where I'm at to with them today, you know. Um, it really is a miracle. Like, me and Jackie, we've been friends for 
oh, 28 years and married for 24. So, I mean, God, if you question miracles, like, it's pretty amazing, you know? But, uh, gosh damn it, the deal is if I cry, I got to make my boys cry, you know, and it probably ain't going to happen. But this program is making me soft. Um, you know, Jackie's an amazing person. Like, she's been through it with me all, you know, through it all with me, you know. And, uh, and it's been tough, but she's just, she's something I'm just real thankful for. She's a first grade teacher, if that says it all. You know, it takes a, per a special person to do that. And uh, I don't know, teaching first grade, she's probably more comfortable here tonight than any of us, given the maturity level. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, newcomers and, and rehab, like, I'm glad you're here. Like, you guys pump me up. I can get nervous, and I start talking to newcomers, and it just lights me up because I'm so excited about what happens in these rooms, you know. So I'm glad you're here, and same for the rehabs, you know. I'm going to jump right in and share a little observation of mine, and that is I believe God, he provides us like this little brief physical reprieve from alcohol or the drug. And it's like we get this grace period, you know, we hopefully find these rooms and the opportunity to hear the solution. And luckily for me, I had a, a man corner me and get me right into sponsorship and the deal, you know. But... I just suggest to you, jump right in, man, if you hear a little bit of something you, you like tonight. You know, don't hesitate, because too many times, and I think what would have happened to me is I'd have sobered up a little bit, come in here, got a little bit of feel good, got a little self-confidence back, and I would be back out there drinking again. You know, I'd be looking at those steps and picking and choosing which ones I needed to do. And uh, I really believe you got to work a full program. you got to take all the suggestions or you're just setting yourself up for failure. So, you know, I hope you hear something you relate to. And uh, just jump right in. I'm glad you're here. I love alcoholics. I'm nervous and I can't sleep and we pound coffee all night, you know. <laughs> but growing up, you know, growing up, I had a good childhood, and uh, after working these steps and taking a look at things as they really were, like, I had a great childhood. I don't share the story that some people do in here and the trauma and all that. I really had it good. Um, I was maybe a confused kid, but my parents done the best they could, you know. I had four brothers. I was the middle of four, and we were uh, middle of five, excuse me. And we were all four years apart, you know. So we never really were that close. Your older brother was always too cool for you, and your younger brother was too lame, you know. <laughs> but they're all good guys today. Like, I could call on any of them. And, uh, you know, just a good family. Like, I'm, I'm the only alcoholic in it that I know of, you know. Uh, but I come from a good family. Dad, he, he was a third-generation mechanic. Um, and he had a shop, and so from a young age, me and all my cousins, we'd get the opportunity to work there after school, and it was really cool because I learned a lot of good skills and got to see a lot of good stuff, you know. But anybody you talk to in the community, like, they're just like, oh, your dad, you know, honesty, respect, just like he's a standout guy, and I, I strive to be more like him. Um, you know, relationships, they count to balance each other out. And my mom, too, she an amazing person. She taught dance. Everybody knew her. She was very respected. But she probably uh, made up with the fire and grit that Dad was lacking, you know. Um, she really tried hard to keep us boys in line, and especially me. There were, she was an ear puller, right? And so when she'd get pissed off, she'd go for your ears and then... It would go from there, depending how bad of a situation it was. But, like, she embarrassed me many a times. Like, she drugged me through the school, like, by the ear and kicking me in the ass with the other, you know, with her foot. And my peers are seeing this. And then there were just numerous situations as a teenager where, you know, things like that were happening. And I kind of resented her. It wasn't a, a big deal, but I did resent her. And to tell you how this alcohol like mind works it's I'm 40 years old before I come into these rooms and uh, that's like a resentment I pack and until I look at it with a sponsor and see how silly it really is and have him say 
so you're being a complete dipshit and your mom's just trying to do what she has to do to keep you out of trouble. You don't see that stuff, you know? And uh, so I can look back and really be thankful for the way I grew up. You know, I was a short, small, late bloomer. So with that goes like being cocky, running your mouth, always trying to fit in, you know? And uh, like I was always switching images, you know? like. One year I was a cowboy and I was all in and the next year I'm riding BMX and mountain bikes and border and that's like totally my image, you know what I mean? And I always fell into a group of friends but I was always just so hyper focused on image. And that's something that stayed with me for a lot of years, you know? Um, I, I probably had my first good drunk when I was like 16. And you know, we, it was great. I loved attention. We all did in abundance, but we didn't know how you were supposed to drink, so why not drink more? It was fun, you know. And the group of kids I ran with, they all had good parents like me, so we had to check in, you know. And so that, that kind of made drinking hard, right? So anytime we could get our hands on a little bit of weed or some painkillers, we'd do that because our parents couldn't detect it, you know. And... Uh, we had a medicine cabinet growing up that was just like, God, nobody was taking inventory on it, you know? <laughs> like my mom and dad still to this day, you call them up after they've just had hip replacements and knee replacements. And it's like, how you doing, you know? And they're like, oh, we're fi dad's, fi he's in a lot of pain, you know? And it's like, well, has he took anything? Did the doctor give him pills? Well, we're, we might try that. We're gonna see, it's been a couple hours since he took two aspirin and we'll see where that gets him, you know? <laughs> And so this shit just piled up over years in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I skated around trouble pretty good. My parents, they knew I drunk, drank and I got in some trouble, but I really not got, didn't get any like great big trouble, you know? I came into these rooms and uh, Jesus Daniel used a term. We call him Jesus Daniel because he looks like Jesus and there's a lot of Daniels, right? He, he used the term Utah double, and it was the first time I had heard that, and that's what I was growing up, you know, is it's like I'm out partying through the week and passing sacrament on Sunday, and I'm just confused, and the reality of it is I was trying both. I just didn't know how to do either one of them very good. Um, so I'm going to fast forward from, well... Me and Jackie started dating when we were really young. She was like 15, I'm 18, right? And uh, so she took part in a little bit of that fun. And uh, when she was 18, a senior in high school, I'm 21, we get engaged. And uh, so we just dropped our group of friends, cleaned up our acts. We had an LDS marriage, you know? And uh, it worked for quite a few years, you know? We moved to Idaho, got away from things. And it wasn't until I was age, I think around 26. Um, and where I'm at kind of at that stage in my life is I'm still real hyper-focused. Um, I've worked this, my way into this gig. I, into, I was doing purchasing, you know, I went from welding to purchasing. And so that was like this really cool deal. And I was making really good money, man. And uh, so like my ego's, huge it's as big as this room at that point I got the material things you know and I'm still caught up on image I'm insecure about working in this job because my older friends around me are so cool I think and they all got degrees and such and there's stress that goes with it right like there's times I fell and I watch a plan of guys walk out that are all pissed off because they're losing money and uh, here's where for me my first real drink happens that I remember, you know? I go on this sales trip for work, and we're in California, and we're out to eat that night, and these older gentlemen, they order drinks, you know? So I order me a drink. And, like, I don't remember very many drunks throughout all these years, but, like, that one, it was just what I'd been searching for, you know? that burning going down my chest, my ears are tingling, I'm on fire. And just all that stress I was feeling about fitting in and work and everything just, mm, it felt so good, you know? And we got pretty messed up that night. That restaurant we was in was really nice and it was a happening atmosphere and I just felt like the shit in there, man. Like, you know, I'm the man. 
and throughout the remainder of this, I don't know what's three or four days on this trip, we just get drunk every night, and I'm loving it. And we come home, and I come back to, you know, Idaho, and, uh, man, if not the next day, but a day or two later, I make myself my way to the liquor store, and I pick up some whiskey. And uh, I start to hide alcohol around the house, right? And it's working. You know, I, I go to work, I get a little stressful. If I need to go home at lunch or whatever, I have me a shot, and it's working. Like, I'm finding the solution to feel a little bit of relief. Um, you know, throughout that time, Jackie finds it, because I'm, like, hiding it in the tool shed, the tax shed, and around different places. And surprisingly enough, well, not that Jackie ever loses her cool, but she really didn't get mad. Like, we both didn't know. We were talking about it earlier. We didn't know what the hell we were dealing with. She's just like, don't hide it from me. Do your deal, you know? And uh, so I didn't. I got casual around the house. I, you know, I was keeping stuff to drink there, and I'd get off work and grab a couple tall boys, pound those, get a buzz going, come home and maintain it. And, uh, like, it was just all the time, even at that point. Now, I wasn't getting sloppy drunk, but I was starting to like the drink, and I'm still involved with religion at this point. And I just wanted nothing to do with it. I started, at this point, shaping my life around the drink, you know? I, I knew the community that I lived in wasn't ever going to approve of what I was doing. You know, I knew the religion wasn't going to work for this drink that I loved. And so... At uh, this time, like, I, I'm, I'm breaking a lot of colts on the side and doing farrier work, and, you know, that's kind of my side gig, and I love it. And uh, I take a gig in Texas training horses for a living, you know. Um, I won't say that all horse training facilities and ranches are like this, but for me, it was the perfect environment to groom an alcoholic. You know, like, you know, there's no time clocks, there's no nothing. You can drink whenever you want, and you got clients coming that show up because they want to have a party and a good time. And it was just where shit really took off and went quick, you know. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the allergy and the obsession at this point because for me, you know, there's the allergy, the phenomenon of craving, right? And what I've learned about that is if I put a drink in my body, then I'm going to have a reaction that regardless of whatever's going on around me physically, my body wants more. You know, I got to keep giving that body more to satisfy that want, you know. And the allergy, damn sure, had its grasp on me at that point. There's no denying it. Like I had to keep getting more alcohol. And when I'd put more in, I needed more. Now, I had a little bit of sanity, I remember back then. I knew what I was doing was probably wrong and heading the wrong direction, but I didn't know what that was, you know? And so there's the obsession, and what the obsession is to me, that's that voice in my head that looks around and it goes, hey, even though these things are going on and it's probably a bad idea, ultimately a drink's a better idea. Take the drink, right? And so that obsession was probably not screaming in my head at that point, but it started doing push-ups, you know? Because with all this drinking, stuff starts happening, you know? And basically what I'm describing right here is the beginning of 12 to 13 years of hard drink, an alcoholic, you know, in full force. And, um, you know, what... When we moved to Texas, it quickly turned into this deal where, you know, I'm drinking every day and I'm passing out a couple times a week. And that progressed to where I'm drinking every day to get to blackout or pass out drunk, you know. Um, it just, it really went there that quick for me. Um, I remember, like, the boys, by this time they're like little dudes, and I would come in, whew. 
to the house at night, and I'd start pounding them. And, uh, God, I ain't got time to cry. <laughs> but anyways, they had seen this shit enough that they knew what was going to happen, and this is their norm, and they'd get enjoyment out of it. But I'd be sitting in the Lazy Boy, holding a beer in one hand or whatever, a drink in one hand, and I'd start to nod off. And I would pour it into my crotch, and it would startle me, right? So I'd jump up, and here are these two little dudes in, like, their, I don't know, their woody pajamas and that shit that's going on, and they just start laughing. Like, they can't wait to see that at night, you know? And as a father, like, it's a horrible thing. Like, I'm thinking, disrespectful little bastards, you know? Who's supposed to be watching them? (laughs) And it's like, dude, what kind of a father am I, you know? And it was just horrible, you know? I get to where I'm I'm drinking all throughout the day, you know? Uh, Jackie, some mornings upon request, she's throwing whiskey in my coffee to get things going. I come home at lunch, I drink more, and and that was a balance I always struggled to find. I had this list of shit I wanted to get done through the day because I was driven that way. And when I would drink the hard stuff, I would pass out, wake up, and then be pissed off because I wasn't getting shit done. So I was always struggling, trying to figure out how to just be drunk enough, you know? And uh, thankfully for me, with what I was doing, I could be pretty damn drunk most of the time and get the job done, you know? (laughs) Um, Me and Jackie, like, we just truly were best friends from from the beginning, right? And uh, we're getting to a point where we're starting to resent each other. And uh, I'm resenting her because she's seeing what's going on. I've left the church, and she starts leaning into it a little bit harder. And, uh, you know, I'm, whoo, damn it, Spencer don't cry, that shit didn't rub off on me, but I'm tearing her down everywhere I can to try and lessen that divide between us, you know, and, uh, like, I'm falling short out there. Oh, God. And so, you know, the only thing I can do, I don't want to put blame on myself, so I, I put it on those around me. Oh, God, I'm so soft. I hear about it all the time. <laughs> It's all right, though. I'm okay with that. Uh, You know, and she's starting to resent me because I'm doing shit at this point that ain't right. And, uh, like, we got a lot of pretty girls that come along around the ranch, and I'm flirty and trying to inflict pain, you know. And what it does is it leads to a point of where I got her really feeling really less than, you know. She's trying in the home to be better and to fix this guy that's drinking all the time. And, uh, you know, I'm up here sharing my story tonight, but it's our story, and we, we talked about it before, and it's, it's just part of the deal. So, anyways, you know, things are happening, right? Jackie, she's getting tired of my shit. I come home every night. There's empties everywhere. She's having to clean up after me so that the kids aren't exposed to it. And, uh, well, this will lighten things up a little bit. I also chewed Copenhagen like crazy, you know. And so as I'm drinking and I'm getting drunk, I'm just spitting in whatever random cup or mug or can I can find. Now, as I'm falling apart, Jackie always kept it together, and she's a jogger. And she goes out for a morning run. And uh, she comes in the house really thirsty, and she grabs her own mug. Um, I did a lot of shit, and that's one of the maddest I've ever seen her, you know? (laughs) And so I don't know. If you can't get a handle on this, at least keep track of where you're spitting, I guess. (laughs) 
But, you know, by this time the obsession, it's strong. It's got its grasp on me and it's speaking loud to me because it's got plenty of ammo, right? I need, I've built that obsession up to where it had plenty of material to justify a drink at the end of the day, even if I slightly questioned it. And, you know, it's saying things to me like, hey, you know, the way you're conducting yourself, it ain't right. You know, that flirting bullshit, that hurts people, that's no good, you know. You're a horrible father, you know. And uh, your your career sucks, you know, you're tearing it down. It's it's just, everything's going to shit, and it's pointing this stuff out, out to me, you know. And by the time I run that through my head for not too long, I'm ready to drink again, you know. And, uh, of course, I would, I would turn back to, drink, to the drink. I'd tried to quit quite a few times. I would throw myself into religion, right? And I'd get a little dry spell. And I love religion. It does wonderful things. And there's a lot of people in here that are religious, and they got stuff I don't have just yet, and I want it, you know? So I think highly of it. But when I would go into it, I think what I would do with that hyper-focus attitude I had, I'd look at that set of parameters, those morals and values they had, and I'd think, shit, if I live within those, and then I try and tap into this God they're talking about, and I got this idea of success over here and what it should look like, and what that looked like was like, you know, success in the show pan as a horse trainer, a big ranch, some trucks, a good-looking family, right? That's what, that's what it looked like to me, and so I thought, well, God, if I stay within these parameters, I tap into you, you give me that, and then I get on a stage and I say, and this is all possible through God, you know, then it's like a pyramid scheme. You get more people coming back to you. <laughs> and it didn't work, you know. I would go in there, I would be sober, I would start to feel like shit because I would screw up, and today I know I'm human, and that's what we do, you know, we just pick ourselves up and learn from it and try and be better. But at the time, I would look at it and go, well, God, how many strikes do we get against us before they kick us out of here, you know? And I've already dealt with this once before. I can't bring this up again. And so I would immediately, you know, it's like a pendulum. I would swing this far with religion, and then I would bell on it, and I'd just jump back that far into drinking again, you know? And I eventually gave up on it, you know? Um, it's kind of funny. We got this picture in our photo album, uh, being from Utah when we were in Texas, the missionaries would always like seek us out because they wanted me to come back, you know. And uh, I'm in the driveway, and I've got a drink in one hand, sidewalk chalk in the other one. Jackie, the missionaries, and the kids are all there, and I got the plan of salvation drawn out in the driveway. <laughs> and I'm explaining to these guys just how full of shit they are, you know. Like, thanks for stopping by, but, you know. The gate, that's there for a reason, like, you know, but, like, I just had no clue, you know, I didn't, and what was really going on at that time is, as I'm sitting here saying this shit, like, I'm tearing down the, the last conception or idea of a higher power that my, ha my family has, you know, and I'm taking that from them, and uh, so, I mean, we're, we're all in this together, like, if you don't think you had an effect on those around you with your drink and, like, well, get sober for a while, work the staff, so it'll come to you. <laughs> um, you know, so at this point, like, I've admitted to Jackie, I got a drinking problem. Like, I'm scared. Like, I don't know what to do. Um, I'm hearing it from her that, like, this isn't right. I got close friends that drink a shitload, I think, and they're pointing out to me, dude, like, this ain't good. You drink too much, you know? But, like, I don't know what to do. And so we're in Texas, and like I'd done before, I was not understand what going, was going on inside, and a lot of the problems was everything everybody was doing to me out here. And so what do we do? We change we change our surroundings, right? Because it's the circumstances that are causing all this shit for me, you know? And so I leave Texas and, well, we leave Texas. I took Jackie and the kids with me. Um, 
and but I play it off as some noble thing like well my career was going amazing you know but we're going to move to Utah so Jackie and the kids can be closer to family you know and what I'm really hoping for is a clean slate I'm hoping I can come up here and I don't know at this time you get a handle on drinking or whatever but that's not the case it quickly just gets worse you know we we get back to Utah and it just escalates I'm full of self-pity galore I'm I'm living in my in-laws basement I'm working for family and you know I'm so caught up in image and all of a sudden I'm just a normal normal working guy like I just it's killing me you know and uh, where it leads me to is uh, you know a lot of suicidal thoughts a lot of depression and uh, you know it got to a point where we hear it in the rooms a lot, like, we don't want to live, but we don't want to die, right? And you're just stuck. And you obsess about it all the time. Like, I would always grab this graph paper at night because writing on graph paper makes you smarter or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I would, like, I would have my life insurance on there and, like, how far the family was going to get with it and glorify, like, what this great thing uh, it would be if I just took myself out, you know, and uh, it's just a horrible spot to be. So, you know, there were, uh, there were a couple more episodes here that really led me to the rooms of AA, and I, I kind of crossed a line with them. You know, Jackie at this point, we're talking about it. We both know I'm just screwed, right? I remember many of conversations where we're just we're crying, but we know there's no hope. We've seen me try and fail. And she's just like, well, I'll just nurse you on to the end, I guess. But, uh, oh, God. I'm going to leave these here and make somebody clean them up after. That's disgusting. <laughs> Anyways, guys, there was some more stuff that happened in the house, you know, and, and it really caused me to start to search. I crossed a line, like I'm bouncing off the walls at night, and Jackie's worried she don't know where I'm going to lay down at night, where I'm going to wake up, and, uh, you know, I'm about to tell you something, and if you drink and you don't think you've done this, it's because nobody's pointed it out to you, but one night she startles me while I'm peeing in the laundry basket, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's like what do you say when you come to something like that? But I'm like, well, no shit, I'm peeing in the laundry. I don't know. You put the toilet seat down. It's inconvenient. But, you know, I say, I say some choice words, you know, and there's some pushing and, and shit that goes on with that. And that was a line I never thought I would cross, you know. And the next morning when I woke up, it's like, shit, did this really happen, you know, did I really say this, what did I say, I'm sorry, but, you know, sorry don't cut it for shit like that, there's stuff you can, there's words you can't take back, and things you did, you, you can't undo, but, you know, it led me to a point where I knew nothing about AA, you know, I didn't know anybody that went, uh, Wow, I'm completely off here now, but it seems to be going all right. Um, I didn't know nothing about AA. I didn't know what happens in these rooms. What I was doing is I'm Googling, and I'm listening to podcasts, and I'm looking for something that's like a, a pump me up. Let's go get life by the horns, you know, and, and shit like that. And I couldn't ever find it. And if I did, it didn't work, you know. Um, but what I kept hearing was, oh, and these 12 steps in my life, and oh, this AA deal or whatever. And so I researched, you know. I, I didn't know if there was AA in Utah. Turns out there is, and a lot of it. <laughs> I researched, and I asked Jackie, I'm like, hey, will you support me? Will you go investigate this deal with me? And of course she did, right? Hell yeah, let's go. 
Now, I remember at that point, it was like, do not tell the kids, don't let anybody we're no, know we're going. And it's not because I was embarrassed to be going to AA or anything. But what I was really happened to do, hoping to do was buy a little time, you know. Um, every, nothing ever worked. I knew it was going to fail. But I thought, God, if it's something there that can hold me over a night or two or give me a little bit of feel good, slow me down. So I didn't want anybody to know because it wasn't going to work. Whew. You know, so I enter the rooms of AA. And... Uh, I liked what I heard, you know, I liked what I felt, and I decided to give it a try, you know, I don't think I mentioned, but after that first meeting, uh, Provo number one, I immediately, the next night or two, went to a meeting at the palace, and I got my hands on a big book, and I'm not much of a reader, but when I got home, that was like the most easy reading and like attractive shit I'd ever read before. You know, I couldn't put it down because for me, I was going, how the hell could I do these other things in my life? And yet I can't simply quit drinking. Now at that time, it was all about the drink still. I thought you take away the drink and I'm good. You know, I had no idea what goes on in here, or here, or here, right? That was something I had to learn, but you know, everything I've said up to this point, it's took sobriety and step work and another person and God to be able to come up with an accurate story of the past. Like I, when I entered this room, I cannot stand up here and, and give you an accurate history of it. You know what I mean? I never looked at it. I never wrote it down. I never understood what was going on. Hell, it would have been lies is what it would have been, you know? And so I'm grateful for that, you know. I'm grateful to be able to sit down with my wife and talk to my kids a little bit about, like, hey, here's what's going to go down tonight. I'm going to share my story. Do you remember it this way? You know, man, that wasn't so good, you know. And I understand that. The other thing I've really learned, and I want to say at this point, it's also really important, and i got to be careful with this today, but a lot of bad shit went down through those 12 to 13 years. But there was also a lot of really, really good stuff. And that bad stuff don't discount that good stuff, you know? Like, I have to be able to look at it and acknowledge the wrongs I did and where I need to better myself and all that. But that don't mean that we didn't have special moments and good times. It's, it's, it's just being able to look at it and understand that. There was bad and there was good. And if I don't maintain my spiritual condition today... <laughs> That obsession of mine will wake up, and it'll grab those bad things that I've taken care of through this step work. It'll remind me of those and tell me, hey, you're a piece of shit, and it voids anything good you ever did. You know? Whew. Yeah, so... It's not too long after the first week of sobriety in the rooms of AA that I cross paths with Spencer. And, uh, you know, he de gives me his number. He demands that I call. And I do what I say I'm going to do, unlike a lot of people in these rooms. Call, goddammit. But uh, he, he asked me some questions that night, and he says, you know, how's life? How's your wife? How's work and all that, you know? And... It's interesting because it's not like I put effort into lying to him, but I just answered, oh, they're all good to all those questions, you know. And it's funny where we're at at that point. We got this side of our head telling us you're a piece of shit, everything's a wreck. But then when we got to open our mouth and talk about stuff, it's all fine and it's okay, you know. And so he's asking me, why the hell are you quitting drinking, you know. 
well, give me a call. So we visit for a while, you know, and I, I proceed to be able to get more honest and transparent with him. I'm starting to relate to stuff in the rooms and then come home at night and call him and stuff and go, I got some more stuff going on here. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be sober today, but there's some stuff going on here. And he's giving me readings and things like that. And not too long after that, I ask him, hey, will you sponsor me? And he's like, what the hell do you think we're doing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know this all happens on God's timeline and I look back at those 12 to 13 years and when I entered the rooms and I'm I'm just so thankful for it today because had I entered those rooms six months earlier, a year earlier, I would have looked at, you know, the hugging that happens here, the shit that's in that book, you know, you need an emotional rearrangement. Like, I didn't even know what a resentment was or emotional this and that. Like, I would have just been like, this shit ain't going to work for me, you know. And But the difference was because of those things that happened and where God had left me, some people would call this willingness, but what it was was the gift of desperation. I came in here, and I'm just like, God, dude, whatever you say, I'll try it, you know? And uh, I'm thankful I was there. You know, I I jumped right into that step work with him, and I had to learn to build a, a relationship with this higher power that I just I thought it wasn't possible, you know? And I was kind of humoring him at the time. Like, he'd give me these assignments, write down what it was. What, and, you know, I had, I had investigated the LDS church. I'd dabbled in the Baptist. We'd hit many of non-denomination by this time. So it was just like, the easy answer was like, I'm Christian, you know. Like, yeah, that's good. Can we move on to the next step, you know? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what's happened, and it's just freaking miraculous, you know. Um, he gave me these exercises like a lot of us do, and I had to define what a higher power was going to be for me. And I looked at that, and it was pretty simple, like a lot of yours. You know, I wanted this guy that was loving and forgiving, wanted happiness for me, joy, all these different things. But I cut things out, like maybe fear that I was feeling and a few things like that. And, uh, you know, I was probably... I was damn sure probably agnostic, not knowing it when I came in here. I really doubted his existence. I was afraid to say it out loud, because by God, if he did exist, I didn't want to get hit with lightning, right? But I really doubted if there was a God. But what I started to see is life just started to get better, you know? And... There were no white light moments or anything like that, but in the back of the big book, it talks about a spiritual awakening. And what that is, is, you know, with faith in a higher power, we're able to acknowledge that we can achieve and do things we never could before. I think I screwed up the, that, but basically we're able to acknowledge that we can achieve things today with faith that we couldn't do before. And that was my experience, right? I'm not drinking. Things are getting better. And with the tools and with him in my head, meaning a higher power, all of a sudden I'm acting in a different way and things are getting better around me, you know? And uh, I have to constantly remind myself of that, like this faith deal. Because I know some guys, and this isn't wrong, they'll say that, you know, dependence in a higher power, like, is all you need and it's completely necessary. Like, here's my deal. Good shit will start to happen for me, and I'll start to take credit for it because it does take a little bit of effort on my behalf. And what I start to do is take a little bit of self-will back, you know, and want to cut him out. Now, the one thing I got going because I'm a member of AA is that I try and take all these suggestions. I got a sponsor. I got step work to do. Hopefully, I'm going to meetings, you know, and I'm doing some service work, all these different things. And every one of those is like an insurance policy on my sobriety, my serenity. And there's times when I maybe doubt God a little bit, and I show up back at a meeting, and I get inspired, and I jump back into this God thing because I'm able to go, you know what, by God, that wasn't me. You know, that was a higher power working in my life, you know. Or 
you know, maybe I get my feelings hurt and I don't like a meeting or I don't like my sponsor that night or what's going on here, but I still got this higher power deal and he turns me back to these meetings and it just kind of constantly keeps balancing each other out, you know? So for me, I got to, I got to do that whole deal, you know, and over and over again. But I'm so grateful to have a higher power in my life today. You know, I talked about never fitting in and all that and never really being in harmony with those around me. And it's not like that today, you know. Um, I felt a lot of loneliness when I was alcoholic. And uh, it's funny, I didn't identify it as that. You hear it so many times in the rooms. It's like, by God, I don't like people. I like being alone and going to the mountains. And, oh, but I'm lonely, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Like, I was lonely, you know, and a lot of that's the disconnect from my best friend I didn't have. But today, I'll still get lonely at times, and usually it's because a few character defects crop up, you know. I cause a little disturbance in the workplace or the home, and naturally I want to isolate. But if I get lonely enough, which I will, I generally will eventually turn back to a higher power. And what happens is I get a little bit of companionship, a little bit of feel-good, and he starts to kick my thoughts out, my crazy thinking, and eventually I find my way back to being a part of. You know, that's what God does for us. He makes us a part of, not apart from. Like, I learned that God dwells in me, and if that's the case, then he dwells in you guys also, you know. And what that does for me, that type of thinking, is it provides me with a lot of forgiveness on what's going on around me. And when I'm able to have that forgiveness for you, I'm able to have that forgiveness for me, you know, and, and I need that because I, I still constantly will stub my toe, you know, and that's why this daily inventory stuff and, and all that's so important because I got to maintain my spiritual condition. It all comes back to that, you know. For those years of drinking, it was all about the circumstances being the problem. Then it transitioned to the, it was the drink being the problem. And then I got in here, and it wasn't the circumstances or the drink, and what you taught me is I'm the problem, you know? And at first, that's like, that's like a kick in the sack, right? It's like, okay, so you're saying surrender, I'm the problem. Did I mention like I want to kill myself and I'm really tired? Like you want service work out of me and you want me to feel defeated, I'm there, <laughs> you know? But the beautiful thing in that is, is today when there's disturbance and I can look in my part and know that I caused some of it, I can take care of my portion. And regardless if there's still other stuff there, like I can feel good and feel serenity and move on. You know, so what a great thing to be able to look at it and go, I got a part in this. And as long as I do my part, you know, <laughs> I hate to use the word guaranteed, but my experience has been I'm guaranteed serenity. And ultimately, that's what I'm, I'm searching, right? I love when I sit with a group of people that have been in AA for a while. And, you know, I sometimes feel bad if there's a newcomer in the room, but we'll be having this meeting topic. And it's like, God, we've been talking for 45 minutes and nobody's brought up alcohol. Why? Because that's what, I, I'm in a group of some people that have worked the steps and they know what's truly going on. Yeah, we're concerned, we don't want to relapse again, but what we're really shooting today for today is avoiding that emotional relapse so we can avoid the drink, right? And uh, yeah, I'm just grateful for that, you know? I'm a happy guy today. Like if I would've came into these rooms and sobriety was any worse than what it was sitting in that lazy boy thinking about death and how horrible it was, like, I don't think I'd be here. There was some stuff that happened in my first year of sobriety. Like, I mentioned I was in the in-laws' basement and stuff, and we were working to get a home put together. And four months into sobriety, money we had wrapped up and stuff, that all fell through. And, uh, you know, looking back, it was for the right reasons. But the funny thing is, it just was not even a big deal at the time. You know, Spencer always told me, you focus here. You know, focus on the rooms, the step work. Quit bitching about the job. I'll, it'll, it'll come together. And it did, man. Like, the life I got today is so much better than what I imagined, you know. It really is. But, uh, you know, 
I'll try and wrap it up here pretty quick. But if you're new, you know, like there's a place in these rooms for you, whether or not you got the DUIs or the crazy record or like that or, you know, whether or not I don't care if you're some religious mom drinking in the closet and running kids to soccer and PTO, like... <laughs> If you think you have a drinking problem and you've felt the way I've felt, which for most of us, it's I've questioned life and I've hurt those that I love most, like there's a solution here, you know? And uh, like, don't worry about this God deal. Like, we think we gotta find God and, you know, he's God for God's sake. Like, he's here, he's present. Like, we just got to figure out how to go with the flow, you know. I mean, we're here tonight, and that's proof. But I do love AA, and I love this fellowship. I love the men and women here, and uh, that's all I got. Thank you. time for